G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of Israel, Past, Present and Future. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. Okay, so welcome to this. We're now into session 14. We are still in the area of Israel future. Well, so we're going to be is Israel future from now on. We're in the time of Israel and the tribulation. We're now looking at Israel in the tribulation. So what we know from the scriptures is that the entire world will be involved in the great tribulation, but it's going to particularly affect Israel. Uh, and we know this from, uh, from the, the huge amount of, of Old Testament scripture concerning this time period. Um, one of the terms that's used is the time of Jacob's trouble. It, it, it is such a the uniqueness of the tribulation's relationship to Israel is, is especially brought out in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 4 to 7. Um, you know, there, there are lots of names for the great tribulation in the scriptures, but Jeremiah uh, 30, 4 to 7, this passage gives a name that directly relates uh, this period to the Jewish nation, calling it the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, while it is true that all will suffer during the tribulation, Israel will suffer more so. Whoops. Uh, and the basic reason for this is for this lies in Israel's unique relationship to God. Because remember, uh, well, back in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, uh, Israel is God's firstborn. And so the, the chosen people, the chosen nation of Israel, will receive double both in blessing and cursing. The principle that Israel received double for all her sins is stated in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 2, and Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 16 to 18. And this is the reason why the tribulation is, is uniquely called the time of Jacob's trouble. And, and remember that uh, Jacob, what was Jacob's name changed to Israel. Now, a graphic uh, general description of Israel in the tribulation is found in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1 to chapter 4, verse 1. Verses 1 to 15 of Isaiah 3 describe the effects of the tribulation on the Jewish leaders. And then this is followed on uh, in chapter 3, 16 to chapter 4, verse 1, with a description of the effects on Jewish women. How are they all going to be affected? Well, the tribulation will involve a removal of their luxury items. We see this in Isaiah 3, 16 to 24. And there's going to be a, a very sharp reduction of the male population until there's going to be a time when there are going to be seven Jewish women for each Jewish male. And you can have a look at that in Isaiah chapter 3, verses 25 to chapter 4, verse 1. So, uh, many of the Jewish men are going to be killed. There are five in the day. We have some Day of Jehovah passages here. Um, there are five of these Day of Jehovah passages that directly relate the tribulation to Israel. Just, uh, just cast your mind back. Um, the Bible is about Israel and God's dealings with Israel. Uh, so. We can understand why the tribulation directly affects Israel. And, um, you know, we need to look at, at history through the eyes of how does history affect the nation of Israel? Because uh, virtually uh, Jerusalem is, is, is pretty much the belly button of the world. Everything revolves around Jerusalem. Okay. Now, these the Day of Jehovah passages. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, describes the Day of Jehovah in relation to the false Jewish prophets in the tribulation. The multiplication of false prophets among Israel will require a massive cleansing. Uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verses 2 to 6 uh, refers to this. Also in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, the day of Jehovah is depicted as a time of darkness and invasion. In Joel chapter 3, verses 14 to 17, it is described as the time of refuge for Israel. In Amos, in Amos 5, 18 to 20, 
it is again depicted as a time of darkness. In Zephaniah 1, verses 7 to 13, it's portrayed as being especially heavy against Jerusalem. This is the tribulation period. So it, it is specifically targeted against the nation of Israel. Now, we're going to see that uh, worldwide anti-Semitism and the persecution of the Jews are going to break out. Um, when does this start to happen? Well, it goes into full force with the breaking of the seven-year covenant. Uh, and this now, uh, this is between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel. And this now marks the beginning of worldwide persecution of the Jews. And two key passages describe what will happen to the Jewish people during the tribulation. First passage is in the New Testament, and it's Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 28. In these verses, Yeshua provided a warning sign to those Jews living at the time the covenant is broken and the abomination of desolation occurs. This second event uh, commences the persecution of the Jews in verses 15 to 20 of Matthew 24. They are warned that as soon as they hear of the abomination of desolation having been set up in the temple in Jerusalem, they are to get out of Israel as quickly as possible. The emphasis that Jesus gives them is it's on speed. Don't turn back for anything. Just get out as quickly as you can. And the reason for the flight is because worldwide anti-Semitism breaks out at this point, at the midpoint of the tribulation, when the covenant is broken. The worldwide persecution of the Jews are then going to continue for the next three and a half years. Uh, verses 21 and 22 show us this. The next verse, 23, contains a special message now directed to the believing remnant within Israel. And it's warning them not to heed any rumor that the Messiah has returned and so come out of hiding. We see this in verses 23 to 28 of Matthew 24. When the Messiah does return, all will see him. Everybody in the world will see him and his return. It's going to be known by all. While all Jews are persecuted, a special emphasis of deception is aimed against the believing remnant. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 17, we also see this is another passage, and this is describing the flight of the Jews out of Israel. The passage begins in verses 1 to 5 with a historical review. Verses 1 to 5 of Revelation 12 summarize the entire life of Yeshua, from just before his birth to his ascension. In the vision, this is the vision that John saw, he saw two signs in the heavens. The first sign depicts Israel as a woman in chapter 12, verse 1. And now this is a, a motif taken from the Hebrew scriptures, where Israel is seen as the wife of Jehovah. We see the sun, moon, and 12 stars, which are also a very common Old Testament figure relating to Israel. And the background for this uh, sun, moon, and 12 stars is, is Joseph's dream right back in Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 to 11. From this passage, from Genesis 39, 9 to 11, John's vision can easily be interpreted. The sun represents Jacob, who was renamed Israel. And both these names, Jacob and Israel, were often used to represent the entire nation. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a couple of references if you like. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27, Isaiah 40, 27, Isaiah 49, verse 5, Isaiah 49, verse 5, Jeremiah 30, verse 10. So in, in those passages, you see that you see Israel and Jacob used interchangeably to represent the, the, the nation as a whole. Now, so the sun we see represents Jacob, the moon represents Rachel who in turn now represents Jewish women, especially Jewish motherhood. Uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Jeremiah 31, 15 and Matthew 2, verse 18. 
the 12 stars, well, they represent the 12 sons of Jacob who fathered the 12 tribes of Israel. So clearly then, the woman arrayed with the sun, moon, and stars is representative of Israel, not the church. It's Israel. In Revelation 12, verse 2, this woman is now seen in the final stages of pregnancy, about to give birth to a child. And the vision is of the nation of Israel just before the birth of the Messiah. You know, a good reason this cannot be the church is that it would be an anachronism with, with the church giving birth to Messiah, whereas actually uh, you know, it was Messiah who gave birth to the church. Not the church giving birth to Messiah. Now, then J John continues and he describes a second sign. This is the great red dragon, and this is Satan. And this is in verse three of John uh, of uh, Revelation twelve. And this is this this great red dragon is Satan in all his fierceness. In verse four, the two signs come together. Satan tried to slaughter the child about to be born. Now, this attempt was the slaughter of the babies in Bethlehem in Matthew twenty uh, in Matthew chapter two, verses sixteen to eighteen. Now, verse 5 of, of Revelation 12 points out the failure of Satan's attempt to destroy the child. The child, destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron, survived until his proper time for death came. And then after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven and is presently seated at the right hand of God the Father. After this historical survey, John's vision then moves forward to events that will occur in the middle of the tribulation. And, and one of these events is described in, in, in verse, verse 6 of chapter 12. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God, that there they may nourish her a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's the same as three and a half years. As in the Matthew passage, the woman pictured here is in flight. And with his attempt to destroy the child thwarted, Satan now turns against a nation that produced the child. Satan's perpetual hatred of Israel is based on the fact that God will fulfill his program of redemption through the Jewish nation, through Israel. And the verse adds the information that Israel's flight and hiding will last 1260 days, three and a half years. This now refers to the second half of the tribulation, because remember, at the midpoint of the tribulation, the covenant is broken. So this is the second half of the tribulation. The next section of Revelation 12, verses 7 to 12, is, is parenthetical. Um, it, it simply provides a cause of Israel's flight. Satan is cast out of his present abode in, in, in heaven and near, now confined to the earth for the next three and a half years. Now, Revelation 12, 13 to 17, then takes up where verse 6 left off. Verse 13 now states that once Satan is cast down to the earth, he's going he's gonna to persecute the woman Israel. Verse 13 needs to be connected with verse 6 as giving a further explanation of for Israel's flight into the wilderness. It should also be connected with verse 12, which concluded that there was woe for the earth. Why? Satan is full of wrath. The reason is that he knows that his time is now short. He only has three and a half years. So knowing this, he now goes all out to annihilate Israel, to persecute Israel. In verse 14, Israel now flees into the wilderness where she's nourished for a time, times and a half, which is the same as a as, as, uh, three and a half years or 1260 days of verse six. Now, in verse 15, it says the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. So this is the persecution is now described in terms of the waters of a river causing a flood so that Israel might be drowned. Again, remember, uh, uh, whenever the figure of a flood is used symbolically, it is always a symbol of a military invasion. However, this invasion will fail in its attempt to destroy the Jews in verse 16. 
It says, but the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. So Israel will succeed in fleeing into the wilderness after being pursued by the invading army. The passage then closes by further describing the wrath of Satan because of his initial failure to destroy the Jews in verse 17. In this closing verse, as in the case of the Matthew passage, Matthew 24, Satan will then make war specifically against the believing remnant among the Jews. For it states that he will make war with the rest of the woman's seed, namely those who keep the commandment of God and hold the testimony of Yeshua. Believers, believing remnant. And this is going to include all Jewish believers among the Jews at that time, as well as 144,000 Jewish evangelists, which we, which we know of in, in chapter 7 of, of Revelation. Now we see Israel and Satan, Revelation 12, 1 to 17, continuing here. This is a central passage describing Satan's relationship to Israel during the tribulation, Revelation 12, 1 to 17. At that time, there'll be an all-out satanically organized campaign to eliminate the Jews once and for all, similar to what Hitler tried to do with his final solution. But Satan is going to go all out to do this. Now, what's the result? Well, to what extent will Satan succeed in destroying the Jews? Zechariah. Zechariah 13 verses 8 to 9 now provides the answer. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, says Jehovah, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part into the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call in my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, Jehovah is my God. Now, cast your mind back into history. During the Holocaust, one third of the world's Jewish population died. Under the fierce persecution of the Antichrist, controlled and energized by Satan, two thirds of the Jewish population will die. This will be the largest and most intense persecution of the Jews ever known in history. Now we see Michael coming onto the scene. Besides being the archangel, this is Michael the archangel, besides being the archangel, Michael is also the chief prince and the protective guardian angel assigned to Israel. The key passage pointing at Michael's relationship to Israel in the in the in the tribulation period is Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. Daniel 12 verse 1 says this, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince who stands up for the children of your people, Daniel's people is Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time your people shall be delivered every one that should be found written in the book. So the fact that Israel will survive at all is due to the ministry of Michael, the archangel and chief prince. Now we're going to see, during the tribulation period, we're going to see four distinct groups of Jews. The first group can be called the apostate Jews. These are the many of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 where, where uh, the, the covenant is signed, it says, it says, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. Uh, and this, and, and so the, the many here are the ones who will enter the seven-year covenant that will begin the tribulation. The he being the Antichrist will make a covenant with the many. Uh, and they're going to comprise about two-thirds of the nation, and, and they're going to die in the worldwide persecution of the tribulation. Second group, is, is known as the 144,000 Jews. Now, they are going to be part of the one-third that will survive. And these are the Jews who will be saved and sealed sometime after the rapture of the church. They are going to be the evangelists during the first half of the tribulation, conducting a worldwide revival. 
you know, the third group can be entitled as other Jewish believers. Well, uh, you now these are Jews who, during the tribulation, will receive the Messiah via the preaching of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists and the two witnesses of Revelation 11 or some other way. Maybe they'll remember what you and I might have said to them uh, before we went. The fourth group is now called the faithful remnant, since they are the key group involved in the second half of the tribulation. They're going to be dealt with separately. Now, the city of refuge. Now, earlier on in, 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 we, in this study, we mentioned uh, that, that when the Jews were in flight, particularly the faithful remnant, uh, they're going to be in flight. However, uh, so far, no spot has been pinpointed to which these people will escape. Until now, we have three clues provided. One clue was in Matthew 24, verse 16. Then let them that are in Judea flee onto the mountains. Now, according to this text in Matthew, the place of flight and refuge is to be the mountains. Second and third clues were given in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, which states that the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God. So not only must the place of refuge fulfill the requirements of being in the mountains, but it must also fulfill the second requirement of being in the wilderness. Thirdly, this place in the wilderness was also prepared by God in advance, which indicates a very adequate place of refuge. So these are the three clues found in passages which we saw earlier. Another passage uh, may have a bearing on the question of where, uh, and that would be the passage found in Isaiah chapter 33, verses 13 to 16. Uh, in, in the Isaiah passage, the context, in Isaiah 33, 13 to 16, the context is dealing with the end time events. Uh, and this, this end time uh, passage here also points out a distinction between the, the apostates and the faithful remnant as far as their protection and preservation are concerned. The means by which protection for the remnant will be accomplished is given in verse 16. He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks, his bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. Okay, now this verse gives some insight as to the nature of the hiding place itself. First of all, it's stated that it will be on high, that is, it's in the mountains. Well, that's what Matthew said. Matthew 24, 16 said that. Second, the place of defense will be the munitions of rocks. Well, that's the very nature of the place. That means the very nature of the place would make it easy to defend. So this brings a total to four clues. First of all, it's going to be in the mountains. It's going to be in the wilderness. It's going to be a place prepared in advance. And it's going to be a very rocky, defensible place. After looking at these clues, Micah chapter 2, verse 12, now pinpoints the place exactly. Micah 2, 12 says this, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of you. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozrah, as a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. So the remnant of Israel is gathered together as the sheep of Bosra. Since the sheep of Bosra are not different to any other sheep, this expression simply means that they are to be gathered in Bosra. Now, the ancient city of Bosra was located in the region of Mount Seir. Mount Seir, S-E-I-R, is a very rocky mountain range, and its name means the Hairy Mountains. This fulfills the requirements of the Matthew passage. It's in the wilderness section of ancient Eden, and this fact fulfills the requirements of the Revelation passage. The very nature of the mountain range of Mount Seir makes it quite defensible. 
fulfilling the requirements of the Isaiah passage. Mount Seir is located on the western side of ancient Edom, the western side. And that's extending from southeast of the Dead Sea to the city of Aqaba. It towers over the Araba, part of the Rift Valley from the south shore of the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Elat. Today, the area is southern Jordan, and Bosra is what we know of today as Petra. Bosra is Petra. So for those of you who have visited Petra, that's where the remnant will be in hiding. Another reason that Bosra was chosen is revealed in the context of Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45. This passage concerns the conquests of the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation as he begins his political takeover of the world. The key information that bears upon the discussion here is found in verse 41. This is Daniel 11, verse 41. It says, He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Okay. Now, the verse states here that while the Antichrist will conquer the whole world, three nations are going to escape to his domination, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Now, all three of these ancient nations currently comprise a single modern state of Jordan. Bosra is located in the region of Mount Seir, meaning in ancient Edom or southern Jordan. Since this area is going to escape the, domin the domination of the Antichrist, it is logical for the Jews to flee to this place. God will provide a city of refuge outside the Antichrist domain for the fleeing remnant. It will be a, a very defensible city located in Mount Seir. Also, the people flee as the people flee, and while they're living there, food and water will be miraculously provided. Now, we saw touched a little bit on the remnant before. Now, the remnant is that part of Israel, the whole, that actually believes in Yeshua, believes in the Messiah. In the tribulation, there will also be a believing remnant. All individual Jews who become believers during the seven years of the tribulation are part of the remnant of Israel. The remnant includes 144,000 Jews of Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 8, and those Jews of Jerusalem who become believers in the middle of the tribulation, according to Revelation 11, verse 13. It includes all individual Jews who become believers as a result of the preaching of the 144,000 or the two witnesses of Revelation 11. It includes a remnant of Revelation 12, verse 17, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. These Satan will attack in a particular way. A large segment of the Jewish population will become members of the remnant of Israel only at the end of the tribulation. And these can be called the faithful remnant. Based upon all the scriptures involved, this group will comprise the majority of the one-third of the nation that will survive the tribulation. Throughout the tribulation, there'll be unbelievers as far as the messiahship of Yeshua is concerned, and also unbelievers as far as the Antichrist is concerned. These are the non-many of Daniel 9, verse 27, who will refuse to have anything to do with the covenant signed by Israel and the Antichrist. Now, according to Isaiah 28, verse 16, these Jewish people shall not be in haste. They are faithful in the sense that they will believe in the God of Israel to the extent of the Old Testament revelation. And this is their trust. However, at the end of the tribulation, they'll come to know who Yeshua 
is as Messiah. Here we see the fact of the remnant that they're going to survive. We find this in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 to 23. Verse 20 says, It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and they that are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again lean upon him that smote them, but shall lean upon Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Verse 21 goes on to say, A remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant shall, a remnant of them shall return. So verse 20 states that unlike the rest of Israel, these Jewish people will lean on the Holy One of Israel. Verse 21. Isaiah declares that ultimately they will return to the God of Israel, a return that can only be accomplished by faith in Messiah Yeshua. And then the first part of verse 22 points out that in spite of the numerical strength of the Jews, only the remnant will return to God. Verse 20, second part of verse 22 and verse 23 then goes on to say, and destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. Verse 23 says, For a full end and that determined will the Lord Jehovah of hosts make in the midst of all the earth. These talk about a decree of destruction that has been determined upon the entire earth, which the remnant will survive. The words used here are much the same as those found in Isaiah 28, verse 22, where the decree of destruction is issued with the signing of the seven-year covenant beginning the tribulation. Combining these two Isaiah passages, it's clear that the remnant will survive the persecution of the Jews and the massive destruction of the earth during the tribulation. So they are referred to as the escaped of Israel here and also in Isaiah chapter 4 verse 2 and Isaiah uh, 37 verses 31 to 32. Also Joel chapter 2 verse 32 and Obadiah verse 17. We're going to see the protection of the remnant now in Isaiah, 48, uh, Isaiah 41 verses 8 to 16. Uh, Isaiah 41, 8 to 16 records that God will protect the remnant by his presence. We'll pick it up in verse 10. A fear you not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Then we get in, in verse 13 to 16, and we see that there's a promise to preserve the remnant in the midst of tremendous persecution during Satan's campaign to destroy the Jews. Verse 13 to 16 says this, For I, Jehovah, your God, will hold your right hand, saying unto you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you worm Jacob and you men of Israel. I will help you, says Jehovah, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I have made you to be a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shall make the hills as chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and you shall rejoice in Jehovah. You shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. So the remnant survives in the midst of tremendous persecution. Now, according to Isaiah 41, verses 17 to 20, just as in the wilderness of Sinai, God did miraculously provide food and water for Israel, in Isaiah 41, 17 to 20, he's going to do the same thing again in the tribulation when the Jews flee to the wilderness. In verse 17, he says, The poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue fails for thirst. I, Jehovah, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. 
I will set in the desert the fir tree, the pine and the box tree together. These miraculous provisions will cause the faithful remnant to reconsider their relationship to God. In another passage in Isaiah 65, 8 to 16, the prophet describes how God will supply for them while at the same time will withhold provisions from the apostates. In verse 10, and Sharon, that's a place, not a person, and Sharon shall be a fold of flocks and the valley of Achor, a place for herds to lie down for my people that have sought me. But you that forsake Jehovah, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for fortune, and that fill up mingled wine onto destiny, I will destine you to the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear. But you did that which was evil in mine eyes, and chose that wherein I delighted not. Therefore, thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. So this passage makes clear, this is Isaiah 65, 8 to 16. This passage makes clear that while the apostates will be allowed to suffer and die, the faithful remnant will be divinely protected and provided with food and water. By this means, the, re the faithful remnant will be able to survive the persecutions and devastations of the tribulation. Now, Israel and the second coming. Now, this is a recap for, for most of you, but for those who have never done it before, what's the basis of the second coming? Well, uh, the rapture of the church we know has no preconditions and it can come at any moment. However, the second coming of Messiah does have a major precondition that must be met for the messianic kingdom will be established. What this condition is can be deduced from five passages of scripture. First passage is Leviticus 26 verses 40 to 42. Now, verse 40 to 42 says this, and they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and also that because they walked contrary unto me, I also walked contrary unto them and brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised heart be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. Now, in these verses, uh, this is in the, back in the Torah, Leviticus, in these verses, Moses predicted how the Jews would be scattered all over the world because of disobedience to God's revealed will. Now, according to, to the New Testament, this came as a direct result of the rejection of the Messiahship of Yeshua. By verse 39 of Leviticus 23, the worldwide dispersion is a fact. And up to this point, Leviticus 26 has been fulfilled. Now, in verse 42, Moses states that God has every intention of giving to Israel all the blessings and promises of the Abrahamic covenant, especially as the covenant pertains to the promised land. However, before the Jewish people can begin to enjoy these blessings of the Abrahamic covenant during the Messianic kingdom, it is first necessary for them to fulfill the condition of verse 40 and confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers. Notice here that the word is iniquity. It's in the singular, and that is, it's a specific iniquity. There is one specific iniquity committed by the fathers and continued by the subsequent generations that Israel must confess before she can begin to enjoy all of the benefits of the Abrahamic covenant. The second passage that speaks of the precondition for Messiah's second coming is Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 11 to 18. 
We'll pick this up in verse 14. Return, O backsliding children, says Jehovah, for I am a husband unto you, and I will take you one of a city, two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I'll give you shepherds according to my heart, who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says Jehovah, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of Jehovah. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they miss it, neither shall it be made any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Jehovah, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of Jehovah to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the stubbornness of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north, the land that I gave for an inheritance unto your fathers. Now, verses 14 to 18. Jeremiah describes the tremendous blessings that God has in store for Israel in the Messianic kingdom. It's going to be a time of restoration for the Jewish people when the kingdom is established by the Messiah. However, however, all of these blessings are conditioned by verse 13. Verse 13. Verse 13 says this, only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against Jehovah your God and have scattered your ways to the strangers under every green tree and you have not obeyed my voice, says Jehovah. So here again, they must confess one specific iniquity that they committed against Jehovah their God. Third passage that speaks of the precondition for the second coming is in the book of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah chapters 12 to 14 are a single unit of thought containing one prophecy that God gave Zechariah. Chapter 13 speaks of the national cleansing of Israel from their sin. Chapter 14 describes the second coming of Messiah uh, in, in verses 1 to 15 and then the establishment of the kingdom in verses 16 to 21. However, the cleansing of Israel, followed by the second coming and the messianic kingdom, are all conditioned on Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah 12, 10 says this, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look unto me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Before Israel will receive the cleansing of her sin and before Messiah will return to establish his kingdom, Israel must first look unto the one whom they have pierced, and must then plead for his return. Once they do this, then and only then will they receive their cleansing and begin to enjoy the blessings of the Messianic age. The fourth passage that speaks of the precondition for the second coming is Hosea chapter 5. Now, in Hosea 5, the one who is doing the, the speaking throughout the chapter is God himself. And God is still speaking in verse 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. So there are certain presuppositions here behind the understanding of this verse. First of all, before anyone can return to a place, he must first have left it. In this passage, God states that he is going to return to his place. Where's his place? Well, God's place is in heaven. Before God can return to heaven, he must first leave it. When did God leave heaven? God left heaven at the incarnation when he became a man in the person of Yeshua of Nazareth. Then. Because of one specific offense committed against him, he returned to heaven 
at the ascension from the Mount of Olives. Isaiah 5.15 further states that he will not come back to the earth until the offense that caused him to return to heaven is now confessed. The national Jewish offense committed against Yeshua is not, as many people think, in killing him. The actual killing of Messiah was done by Gentiles, not Jewish hands. Uh, he was condemned and sentenced by a Gentile judge. He was crucified by Gentile soldiers. But you know what? Regardless of, of Jewish acceptance or Jewish rejection, Yeshua would have had to die to become the sacrifice for sin. He had to die. Now, the national offense of Israel was in the rejection of his Messiahship. According to Hosea 5, verse 15, only when this offense is acknowledged or confessed will he come back to the earth. And the fifth passage is Matthew 23, which contains, Messiah, uh, which contains Messiah's denunciation of the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, they were the Jewish leadership of that day. They were denounced for leading the nation in the rejection of his Messiahship. He was still speaking to the Jewish leadership in verses 37 to 39. And Messiah reiterates his original desire to gather the Jewish people if they would only accept him. Verse 37 says, oh, this is Messiah speaking, this is Jesus speaking. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that kills the prophets and stones them that are sent unto her. How often I would I have gathered your children together even as a hen gathers her chickens onto her wings, and you would not. Because of their rejection of his messiahship, in place of being gathered, they're going to be scattered. Their house, meaning the Jewish temple, will be left desolate and will be destroyed with nothing remaining. Verse 38 tells us this. He says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate, nothing remaining. Then Yeshua declares in verse 39, For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now this is a quotation of Psalm 118 verse 26. This is a verse from a messianic psalm that Yeshua was quoting. So, Yeshua will not return to earth until the Jews and their leaders ask him to come back. And just as the Jewish leaders led the nation to the rejection of the Messiahship, they must one day lead the nation to the acceptance of his Messiahship. This, then, is the twofold basis of the second coming of Messiah. Israel must confess her national sin which was a rejection of Messiah based on the fact that he was demon, that on the, on, the, on the premise that he was demon possessed, and then plead for Messiah to return. And then, and then they're going to mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, uh, Zechariah 12 10. Until these two things happen, which is uh, confessing their, their national sin and then pleading for his return, th there will be no second coming. I mean, no second coming. In verses in uh, the national um, uh, regeneration of Israel, we, we see here, um, we've seen the two facets or the two preconditions for Messiah's second coming. It's important now that we just go back to uh, Romans 11 and we need to connect it up to uh, the national regeneration of Israel. First up, we see the confession of Israel's national sin. Hosea uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, is a continuation of Hosea 5. Remember Hosea 5, 15, I'll go and return to my place. I to be called me to come back again. Okay, so Hosea 6, verses 1 to 3, contains the acknowledgement of the sin uh, demanded in chapter 5, verse 15. The first two verses of Hosea 6 contain a call issued by the Jewish leaders exhorting the nation to repent and confess their national sin. Verse 1 says, Come, let us return unto Jehovah, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten 
and he will bind us up. After two days, will he revive us? On the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live before him. So in Isaiah 6, 1 to 3, the leaders finally recognize the reason for the tribulation has fallen on them. Just as they once led the nation to the rejection of the Messiahship of Yeshua, they will now lead the nation to the acceptance of his Messiahship by issuing that call. And the actual words of this acknowledgement are given in Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 9. The confession of Israel's national sin will last for two days as the entire nation becomes regenerated and saved. And then on the third day, Israel is now saved as a nation. Only then will the physical blessings Israel once enjoyed be now restored to her. And we see this in verse 3. And let us know, let us follow on to know Jehovah. His going forth is sure as the morning, and he will come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain that waters the earth. In Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 9, we have the confession. And in this confession, the Jewish people admit that the nation had looked upon Yeshua as nothing more than another man a criminal who had died for his own sins. That's what they believed. Now they recognize that he was no ordinary man, but the perfect Lamb of God, the Messiah himself. And furthermore, it was not for his own sins that Messiah died, but it was for their sins, so that they need not be stricken for their sin. And so the national regeneration will now come by means the national confession of Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 9, and then the nation as a nation will be saved. And that is our lot for this week. Study hard and grow strong. Thank you for coming along.